In this video, we'll be talking about FCN8, also known as a fully convolutional network. But before we do this, there are two architectures I like to go over first, which is VGG16 and ResNet. So back in 2010, there was a data set called ImageNet that was released, and this was mainly to be meant for large scale image classification. So every single year you have the ImageNet challenge and pretty much within the computer vision space, this allowed for a lot of competition where teams could come in and try to outdo previous teams and build you know, better and better networks and try out different architectures. Um, one of the early architectures that came out of this was VGG16. And VGG16 tried to take a very systematic approach to building the convolution and pooling layers that eventually builds out the feature space that we can use to do classification on an image. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how that happens. All right. So if you were to take a look at this image over here, let's just take a look at the roof, for example. Um, where my cursor is right here, you've got some pixels. And if you were to go a little bit further on the roof, you've got some more pixels, but they look identical, right? So there's a lot of redundant information. And really, when humans look in an image, the way we derive its meaning is from edges. It's specifically between the change from one pixel to another. So one way that we build this up and we create uh, kind of abstractions of the information with an image is um, what's called convolution and pooling. So in the beginning, we start very general and we do two convolution layers with only 64 filters. And then this will get pulled down uh, to reduce it like max pooling of a two by two. So the image in, in terms of like the X and the Y dimension will get divided by two, okay? Um, and so eventually we keep reducing a lot of this like useless information. Like we know that the pixels here are the same color so we can just make that more dense, a more dense representation. And we just keep doing this. We do convolution. Um, these red blocks are max pooling. So we pull down convolution, we pull down, and eventually we create a very dense vector that we can use to describe what's happening in an image. And then we do some inference and we eventually go into a soft max to classify 10,000 different classes. Okay. Um, and so typically this process of extracting all that information from an image is called encoding. Uh, because you're taking something that's very big in dimensionality and reducing it to something very dense, like uh, 4096 here, okay? And this process is very destructive because you have pooling. Um, and so another network that kind of came from this was ResNet. And ResNet was a little bit different because um, I think a lot of researchers realized that if they wanted to make their networks deeper, and still learn meaningful information because eventually information just keeps getting lost. And you have to, the only way you can kind of learn new information from previous layers is you just have whatever has been passed down to you. Um, one way to kind of give neural networks more context is to create what's called a skip connection. So ResNet, um, let's say we have an input image, we call that X, and then we have some convolutional blocks. So the output of uh, these convolutions of x is going to be f of x. Um, but we can use what's called a skip connection where we take the original input image and we add it into uh, the output of these conf blocks. And so ResNet50 was basically just creating all of these residual blocks and then stacking them up 50 times and using that to build a lot of the information about the image. Um, so what you're really trying to learn is the residual between uh, the input and f of x. And that, that kind of keeps coming. So identity will just keep skipping down and down. And the network has a little more information to use. They're not really, it's not completely destructive like something like VGG16. So let's take both of those main ideas, the idea of like an encoder-based network and a skip connection and we can start to understand the process of how uh, FCN8 works. Now we're ready to start talking about fully convolutional networks. So when it comes to semantic segmentation, what we're actually trying to predict is uh, an output mask. So this mask will have the same width, the same height as our input image, but now 
the depth of this mask is actually going to be equal to the number of classes that we're interested in running classification on. So what we're actually doing is we're predicting the class of each individual pixel in an image. And it just so happens that oftentimes what we're trying to kind of capture will kind of be based on the semantic importance that we might see in an image, which are usually objects, okay? But this can really be like anything. Um, it's, it's used for uh, quite a few other purposes as well. So how does this actually happen? How do we predict uh, an output mask? Well, I think previously I've talked about the encoder and the encoder really builds up what in this image should I be paying attention to? What edges will really make up uh, you know, something that's going to be a person or something that's going to be a bike. Well, this happens, and this is the same encoder that we're seeing from something like VGG16. And so if we're just talking about the width and the height, the width and the height gets, you know, divided by two every single time it goes through these pooling layers. And at this point, by the time we hit pool five, we can actually do something called uh, upsampling. And in the paper, they use bilinear upsampling, um, I actually ended up using transpose 2D convolutions for upsampling, but we'll get into that later. Um, if you wanted to reconstruct the same width and the same height as the input image after pool 5, you would actually have to do something uh, and you would have to upsample 32 times. And so the resulting segmentation mask of that would look very coarse. And you can see it's, it's really bad. Like we kind of know the general area of where the bike is, where the human is but so much of the course information has been lost because it's been pulled down so many times. Um, so when we go to upsample, a lot of that context of where uh, these features are located has been lost. So one way that we can kind of combat this and make use of uh, residual connections I talked about within ResNet, I mean, sorry, skip connections, uh, you can do something like, you could upsample pool five twice and then you can add that prediction in with the output of pool four. So um, you would upsample pool five twice and then add it with pool four. And at this point, you could actually just upsample 16 times. So you'd be able to reconstruct the, the same dimensions of the input image again. And the resulting segmentation is a little more fine, you can see here. And so hopefully you're picking up on the idea that Okay, yeah, I, I could take this output from the summation and I could, again, upsample twice, all right? And, oh, just so you're aware, the reason why they're called 32, 16, and 8, if you wanted to upsample from pool 5 here, you would have to use a stride of 32 by 32 um, in order to reconstruct that. And the same thing with FCN 16, you would use a stride of 16 by 16. But here we're just upsampling with a stride of 2 by 2, stride of two by two until eventually we just keep going and we take the output of pool three we add it in with um, our, our now four times upsampled prediction and then we do a final upsampling with an eight by eight uh, stride of our, our filters for our convolution and the transpose convolution and so what we end up doing is we kind of recover the same uh, dimensions as our input image and the resulting segmentation mask is much more fine um, although we would still consider this coarse segmentation because the size of that filter is actually an 8 by 8 so and if that didn't make sense to you um, we'll go a little bit more into this and explain it again in the next slide so here we have a, a slightly different diagram of FCN8 and in this slide I really want to be focusing on what happens to the depth of a lot of these layers as we go through the encoding and the decoding portions of the network. So um, to kind of go through here, if you're going through the encoding process and you're taking the output from pool three, well, okay, you're doing 2D convolutions to build up these filters, um, but you're using 256 filters. So at this point, we actually have to take these 256 filters and make uh, some kind of prediction as to um, something that will have the same number of classes as our segmentation mask. And this is the reason why they are called fully convolutional networks as opposed to something like uh, an image classification net, which would typically flatten out the features and then just create a dense layer. Um, there are no dense layers here. We're actually doing something called, uh, we're still doing a 2D convolution operation to go from pool three to this predict three. 
Um, but what we actually do is we use a one by one kernel size within that 2D convolution. So, uh, and we're using number of filters that is going to be equal to the number of classes that we're trying to output. So predict three will have a depth of six for six classes, obviously. And that happens by using a one by one convolution. Okay. And so this way we can reduce our dimensionality um, to something much more dense, but still maintain a lot of the information. Um, and that, that's actually one of the novel uses of a one by one convolution. Um, and if you've never seen that before, it's probably famously used in stuff like ResNet and Inception blocks, but um, that's kind of the idea. So again, in pool four, we've got 512 filters. Well, we need to use a one by one convolution with six filters so that we can kind of create that same thing. And we just go along the network. Um, there's one other thing that I kind of need to mention here. This is pool five. Um, there's an option to use these two convolution layers here. So this would be comp six and comp seven. And this is just doing further inference on our already really dense encoding, just so you're aware. Um, so again, we take these 4,096 filters, one by one convolution, six filters, and then we go through the deconvolution process. So we upsample twice. We add that uh, upsample into the output of pool four that gets upsampled twice again. So at this point, um, we've actually gone, we've upsampled by four from our most dense pooling layer. And then we add that into the prediction from pool three, okay? And so, and then that gets upsampled eight times, so FCN eight, and that produces our softmax. So hopefully that helps kind of represent the whole encoder decoder based model. And at this point, let's actually take a look at the tensor board and I can show you some like some of the results of what FCN8 uh, typically looks like in terms of its core segmentation. So I actually just trained up uh, an FCN8 model and we can take a look at the resulting tensor board here. So if we kind of scroll in here, we've got the encoder being built and we keep going down and down through the encoder until eventually we hit the convolution six and seven, okay? From there, we do our, our upsampling with a 2D transpose convolution. And at this point, uh, the number of filters for this would be equal to our number of classes. So in this case, five, right? And here's the, the one by one convolution that I talked about before that matches um, the output from pull four. And then we can add those together. It upsamples by two. Again, another one by one convolution to go from pull three. And then you can add those together you do a final uh, eight by eight stride for your uh, upsampling, and then you produce the, the segmentation mask. So the cool thing about this tensor board is that I have implemented intermediate predictions on specific images that you might be interested in looking at. So we can actually go through the, the history of the whole model and you can see how it progresses and what it learns at different stages. So let's take a look at that now. If you move these sliders all the way back to the beginning, you can see it in the beginning, it really hasn't learned anything. You can kind of see the edges. And as you move through, eventually, okay, now we're learning the edges of the image. We go through again. Oh, that's weird. Okay, so <laughs> it went all the way from 30 to 110. But so now we went from just learning edges to we actually learned what side of the edges contain the information that we're interested in. We haven't really figured out the individual classes yet, but we have seen kind of like there's a boundary. It's it's figured out background, right? And so if we go a little bit further, now it's starting to figure out the individual classes for each uh, image. But the cool thing about this, I think, is that you can see the blocks from, I mean, again, we're using an eight by eight uh, stride. And I think, yeah, we're also using an eight by eight uh, eight by eight filter. So the segmentation is actually very coarse and you can see really all the different blocks. And and so the resulting segmentation mask is very coarse for FCN8, um, but we could use something like conditional random field post-processing and we can actually improve these masks. Um, but we'll be talking about that in the uh, two videos from now, I guess. So yeah, this is the tensor board. It's the, probably the coolest aspect of this whole uh, code base is that you can see 
the neural network learn as it goes. And normally um, you don't have access to this kind of stuff. Like classification models are really boring, right? But semantic segmentation, you can start to do this kind of stuff and you can see how the network's progressing. So um, yeah, in the next video, we'll be doing this whole process uh, again. The lectures can be much shorter and we'll be talking about UNet, all right? And UNet will be able to produce something that has much more fine segmentation from what you're seeing uh, in this TensorBoard output, all right?